Okay, so things I like to read in the summer are a little fun, a little popcorny, bubble gummy, slide the slide, ride the ride. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I am going to recommend a quick trio trio of books um, that all center around the theme of interspecies love, interspecies trips, flings, emotional relationships. Hello, listeners. Dukes here, uh, and I'm really excited to get to this episode. This is the third and final in our summer reading series. And in this one, Chris and I are each going to make a summer reading recommendation for you. Definitely some courtship behavior going on with these two lizards. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, kind of on theme for the episode. Um, Anyway, I'm excited to introduce the third in our summer reading series. In this one, Chris and I are each going to share a recommendation for a summer read, and we get a whole bunch of recommendations from you, our listeners. It's going to be great. So just a few quick notes before we get started. One is that Chris was remote. He didn't have access to his recording setup, so we just had to use the Zoom recording. But you'll, you'll understand him just fine, and you'll get used to it. Uh, Second, the pitcher, whose name I pronounce in several different ways in this episode, um, in an attempt to pronounce his name correctly, um, well, that pitcher, I didn't get his name correct any of those times. It's pronounced Stephen Shock. Stephen Shock. Also, I seem to have a problem with pitcher names in this episode more broadly. Uh, Greg Maddox, um... I refer to him as Doug Maddox several times. I don't know why other than I think it's a sign of my aging brain and a sign of things to come, which I'm not super happy about, but there it is. I'm still pretty sharp. Um, yeah, I think that's everything you need to know. It is uh, the first day of summer here in L.A., and it is glorious. And by the time you hear it, it will definitely be summer, so... Sit back and enjoy some summer reading recommendations from Upper Middlebrow. Okay. The number of times I have to re-sign into Zoom is extraordinarily high. Zoom yes. seems to kick us off. Yeah. As soon as I open one computer, it instantly logs me out of other the other devices. Like so I get like it's like if I open my laptop at home, the desktop is like, you're out. And then yeah. I get like That's yeah, probably notifications on my phone too. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's weird. Zoom seems to, it's like, um, it's like, uh, they're, they're sort of like stormtrooper sentries. They're like incredibly difficult to deal with in like a very narrow kind of uh, band of, um, of uh, adversity, mm. but then like incredibly permeable for a, any other kind of uh, thing. Hmm. So like Zoom will sign you out all the time, but apparently, you know, people can log into your meetings and drop penises on your whiteboards. Well, I mean, I think that was often those meetings did not have passwords. I mean, they, you know, the, there's a certain That's amount, true. there's a certain amount of uh, the penis and whiteboard era, hopefully is largely <laughs> past, past yeah. us. It's like a real like, eight month period yeah like, yeah 2020 <laughs> that was uh 2020 spring they sort of figured it out by the fall it's kind of what our friend justin's book is going to be about although we don't we don't talk about that specific problem you don't talk so, about penises and whiteboards in the book no, not that i recall and i i, yeah. I last week read through every single word so nice. uh, i think i think <laughs> i would know uh so i had an idea of rather than a ramble of starting this one with a quiz kind of inspired Do by it. my pick are you all right with that so the question is, yes. what do Tina Fey, Edgar Allan Poe, Stephen Scotch, or Stephen Scotch, or Stephen Shosh? It's the same person. I'm just, I'm just hedging my bets when it comes to pronunciation. Okay. And Jesse Dukes all have in common. Tina Fey, Stephen Scotch, Edgar Allan Poe, and Jesse Dukes. Yes. Um, okay. First random guess birthday. Nope. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next random guess, uh, birthplace. 
Nope. But mm. but 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 that's good. That's good thinking. You know, you're okay. you're in the right genre. Uh, place of education. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Tina Fey, Edgar Allan Poe, Stephen Scotch, and Jesse Dukes all attended the University of Virginia. Uh, Stephen being the current senior closer uh, for their baseball team, which is in the World Series of Baseball. And though I will also say, and I'm going to demonstrate to you in the, uh, the, the truth of this in just a second, another thing they have in common is they're all fucking hilarious. Um, <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe, actually, you may not, obviously Tina Fey is hilarious. Any listener to this podcast knows that, you know, apart from my modesty, uh, humor is probably my greatest quality. Um <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you laugh at that hilarious well, yeah, joke no, for a moment. I need to laugh at that and then comment about it. That's like that's like one of the most classic like humor setups of all time. I just love that. The like I don't even know what it's called, but like it's like the pornography thing. Like I know that joke setup when I see it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I really wish I, I need like a I need like a joke dictionary or a joke encyclopedia that will allow me to define those terms effectively. You know, I've been wanting to, you know what, this would be a good time for me to write this book proposal. I've been wanting to write a book mm. that's just what is funny, it, oh. that, that explores both classic <laughs> joke structures, the history of comedy, but also the biological evolutionary history of laughing and laughter and why mm. we do it. I have a hypothesis that it is it's a sound we make when fear is leaving our body. You know, we, we've decided, oh, we're not going to fight. We're, mm -hmm. this is, you know, so like when apes start laughing, that means like, oh, something funny happened. The tension's resolved. We're not fighting right now. Whoo, what a relief. Um, which is also, <laughs> I think, why we sometimes nervously laugh, even when nothing funny has happened, because you're, you're trying mm -hmm. to let some of that fear out. <laughs> yeah. um, that makes sense. My, um, my, my reaction to getting a chiropractic adjustment is to burst into, like, wild laughter. Mm. Um, and, uh, and usually I think it's because, like, there is something really unsettling about getting uh, a chiropractic adjustment. Um, but, uh, yeah, we should talk more about humor. Uh, we're already departing the realms of your quiz, well, um, but I mean, we're still in orbit. We're still in orbit. So, or university of Virginia, all four fucking hilarious. Yeah. Um, I Indeed. was trying to insert a joke about the university of Virginia Cavaliers being presently in the world series. Uh, even though the true world series of baseball doesn't happen until November. I believe you are referring to the college world series. It is, it is branded as the quote college world series, which is sort of a double misnomer. If you think about it, because You're the right. world series, world series, isn't really the world series, but the college world series is definitely not the world series, <laughs> but you know, if they were going to rebrand, they could call it like the universe series or something. There's no mm -hmm. rules about these things. You can call whatever there series. There aren't. Yes, no, this is why you get this like spiraling number of European club soccer competitions, like right. the Europa Conference League final, which you're like, what the hell does that mean? Wasn't there one, what was that you were joking with me and you, there was one that's just called like the Leaguey League or something like that? or the uh, Yes, the, uh, the Carabao Cup, which yeah. like everybody is like, what is the Carabao Cup? Uh, and so the men in Blazers now refer to it as the Cuppity Cup Cup. Cupity cup cup, right? Indeed. So similar spirit here. So I'm gonna play you an interview if the sound sharing feature works, and I really hope it does, because if not, we're buggered. Um, uh -huh. Because I'm gonna do more <laughs> of that of uh, Stephen Scotch giving a post game interview after he saved a game that basically kept UVA in the World Series of Baseball against Duke. So let's try. Let's make sure I can share the screen. Share. Okay. You are you seeing my Reaper? I am seeing your Reaper. All right, so here is Mr. Scotch, here is Mr. Scotch, here's Mr. Shosh, here's Steven. Uh, this is, and is it the, for visual, he's standing on the pitcher's mound and he's got a headset and then the broadcasters are talking to him and then the camera long lens is focused on him. So he's kind of like got this kind of shit-eating grin throughout this interview and he's kind of looking up at the broadcast booth, but nobody's sticking a mic in his face. So here it goes. You know, you walk into a stadium, 8,000 people, they all want you to lose. But as long as you got your 26 guys ready to kick ass or kick butt, um, <laughs> you're going to be all right. Sorry, I sweared. I shouldn't have No, sweared. you're good, man. Let, let's go back to that last inning, ninth inning. What are the emotions like entering that inning? Well, the emotions are go in, win. I heard a fan offer free dipping Dots if I blew it, which 
<laughs> the price of dipping dots with inflation is just unreal. So for a brief moment, I was like, damn, dipping dots sound good. But also, I thought in the back of my head, we win today, we win tomorrow, or tonight. We're going to be here another day. That's more per diem. So that means I can buy my own dipping dots and be a winner. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to attack. And Steve, it's really easy pitching when you got defense like ours. I tell you, it's so easy when when they're yeah. behind you. As long as you Dynamite keep it in the yard, you. you got a chance, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Does anything make you nervous? Caves. <laughs> Mainly. Um, nothing really. I mean, I don't see any caves out here. <laughs> I don't see any caves out here as, as the pitcher of a major university division one baseball program. He I'm goes really on to talk about the sort of landscape in which you would find caves and which landscapes you don't find caves. This goes on for, that was only about a third of it right there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I gave you, I, I mean, I think my favorite moment is the, you know, if we win today, uh, that's another per diem. I can buy my own dipping dots and be a winner, which is yeah. logical <laughs> and hilarious. You know, it, it makes me, it reminds me that like baseball interviews are the best interviews um, that like, because I think baseball is such an odd sport and like really um, sort of filches like the odder parts of the American um, society into like into it. Um, this is why you get such amazing like names in baseball. Um, but it's just their baseball players are so different from any other kind of athlete out there. I, I was going to say, I think it is among team sports, the jock nerdiest sport, at least in the American context. I mean, sure. There are some meathead left-handed six, seven relief pitchers out there who are dumb as a post, but, um, and this guy has a little bit of that affect too, but he's like the smartest uh -huh. version of that, you know, that you could yeah. ever imagine in a clever, but there's something inherently nerdy about baseball. I think too, I think has something about the pace and that you can track it with a box score and that, you know, the way statistics are kept, um, it is very, it's a very nerd friendly sport. Mm -hmm. And one form of nerd is the wag, you know, the humorist. Um, yes. And so I think there's a lot of overlap. I also think that there is also, I could be wrong about this. I'm just positing, though, that there's actually more to talk about in baseball interviews because, you know, like base, basketball, it's sort of like the coach tells you what to do. You either do it or you don't. Um, and baseball, to me, seems to have more infinite permutations of tactics and strategies. And I may be wrong about that. If I was a basketball coach, I might entirely disagree. But, you know, just like I love going to a baseball game and just like watching the third baseman shift for yeah. different batters, you know, which is now illegal. Oh, really? Have oh, they can't they can't shift across. You can only put so many people on one side of the base. You can't do a. But they can still, they'll still <laughs> shift side to side, shifting, front and back and stuff yes. like that. But you can't do, yeah. You yeah. can't play like the stand, like the real aggressive, like, let's take all of our infielders and park them between like first and where the yeah. shortstop would stand. Apparently that is now, that is no longer legal. Sad room. Um, I disagree with it. Of like, yeah, speeding things up. I think you're right. I think that all of our sports that have more play stoppages in them uh, tend to be a more tactical game because mm. like of course like then the coach can like spend more time structuring what's going to go on like american football is a great example yeah. uh rugby also would yeah. be a, a good example because there are a lot of like play stoppages where you can kind of reset things basketball less so i yeah. think foot, uh, uh european football soccer uh same thing like you have to get your tactical know-how and understanding sort of set in practice it's in practice like there has to be a lot more of like the players really know what's like how they're going to improvise basically. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, I also think with baseball, you have play stoppage. So the managers and the various coaches, batting, pitching base coaches can assert themselves. But I also, you have nine players on the field who also, and then you have base runners who are also making tactical decisions all the time. I mean, one of my favorite plays I ever saw in baseball, I think it was, I think it was the 2004 world series 
Um, uh, which the Red Sox won, uh, yes. sweeping the St. Louis Cardinals in four games, uh, winning uh, in St. Louis at the very end, I just have to say. Yes. I'm contractually it, obliged as a resident of New England. <laughs> to a great up. moment in our town's history. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I believe also they defeated the uh, Yankees in the playoffs, and that was much more of a nail-biter. And I believe it was during that series that I saw some Red Sox hit a deep drive, probably off the Green Monster, and Hideki Mm -hmm. Matsui was the Mm -hmm. Yankees' left fielder. There was a runner on second. He saw the ball, immediately glocked that it was going to hit the Monster, but yep. he played it like he was going to catch it in order to hold the runner on second until uh, the last moment. Very, very clever. And yes. and so he kept he kept the, the runner from scoring on a double, basically. I mean, he advanced to third, but not... Um, Which is amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> and it's incredibly yeah. heads up. And, you know, and he, you know, in the replay, you see him decide on that strategy within three-tenths of a second of the ball leaving the... But faster than... I mean, yeah. he knows... Soon as the contact's made, he knows he's not going to get it, and he knows he's going to act like he's going to get it. And then, even when he turns, it's too late for the base runner too. And it, yeah. I mean, it's just there's so many permutations to that. And and uh, yeah. Anyway, we're not here to talk about baseball, but that is a preview of my summer reading recommendation that I'm going to give Ooh. later in the episode. Um, but what I actually was hoping we could start with was some of the voicemails that we got. Uh, a couple of the voicemails. Uh, yeah. Awesome. So. Uh, sharing again, share sound. Okay, so here is our first listener audio memo recommendation. You'll recognize this. Hi, I'm Justin, friend of the show. I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. So summers are a big deal for me because I usually have summers off. Um, and for the last few summers, I've been binging on N.K. Jemisin's uh, science fiction and fantasy, speculative fiction, which I can't recommend enough. She is an incredible world builder. Uh, she, the, the three series that I've really spent time with are her Inheritance series about a world in which people have enslaved their gods, uh, the Fifth Season series, which uh, the Upper Middle Brow guys are talking about where climate change is transforming society and forcing people to live in new ways. And then uh, the, the duopoly, the killing moon duopoly, where um, people have learned to harvest the energy of dreams. Uh, all of her series are incredibly captivating. They're deep, they're rich, uh, they're uh, really fun to read. Um, One of my favorite memories is being uh, windbound on a little island on the coast of Maine um, and uh, spending the night uh, with storms blowing overhead, um, reading N.K. Jemisin's Inheritance Trilogy through the night. Nice. Yeah, you know, I I grabbed the next two books of the Broken Earth Trilogy because I just thought the fifth season was just so good and I can't wait to, to jump into the next two of them. Which we have we have recorded episodes about that the listener will not have heard just yet. <laughs> um, totally. But it was the last book we talked about, but we're going to stick, I think we're going to stick this episode before uh, yeah. we hear those. Yeah, I mean, I think just listening to Justin's sort of recap and his little, like, like brief um, summary of her other work, I think the thing that strikes me is just the uh, the wild inventiveness of, uh, of her imagination. And that like, wow, I mean, harnessing the power of dreams in one and uh, like, like wild seismology of the Broken Earth trilogy. Um, I, I just, you know, really, she really allows herself to range all over the place in such a way that I think is important for any writer. Um, yeah, it's a good lesson to all of us to keep our, you know, keep our, keep our minds open about the places that we want to take our readers. Yeah, I mean, also this in all of them, you're, there's sort of a, a allegory about where does the sort of energy source of our existence mm. come from to um, sort of fascination with that. You know, it's, it's a kind of like what is the foundation of what we might call the economy and also what we might call the systems and structures. The other thing that really strikes me about Justin's voicemail that I love, I just love the memory of reading a book all night when you're windbound in a tent, you know, and the way in which when you're on a trip, which a lot, you know, a lot of us travel in the summer, 
how having the right book on the trip can make a huge difference, you know, and it can also bring you through some challenging moments. Like I remember uh, being in Tunisia a few years ago and I was on this train and it was like 100 degrees outside and the train's air conditioning wasn't working. No, it was a bus <laughs> and it, the air conditioning wasn't working or maybe it was working, but it wasn't keeping up. So and there were like 60 people on the bus and it was sweaty and it was dusty outside. and It was just and I um, I had actually had an audio book of um, Reem D, the Neil Stevenson novel, uh, which is very long. Um, yeah. And I just kind of like went into a Reem D audio book nap for six hours, like my body kind of hibernated because it was very physically uncomfortable. And, you know, it, it was okay. It got me through, you know, what would have been a very long bus ride, just, you know, allowed mm. me to sort of nap and drift and listen to a very entertaining uh, book. So I love that about Justin's, uh, I love that about his account of summer reading. My, uh, my analog is uh, I once decided it was gonna be a really good idea to take the Amtrak train from Oceanside, California, where I had just done a triathlon, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all the way back to Portland. That's a long uh, is, way. Yeah, it is a 33-hour uh, Amtrak train. You, you sort of leave at around 8 or 10 in the morning on one day, Jeez. and you arrive in Portland kind of in like the middle, late afternoon, early evening the following day. Wow. And um, I didn't have a sleeper mm. berth because... Uh, you know, non-American readers, it's insanely expensive it's in the expensive. U.S. for birth on an Amtrak. Uh, and my seatmate um, was among a group of five or six people who drank so much that they eventually were forced off the train in Eugene, uh, which is hilarious. They made it like 31 hours of a 33-hour train ride and then were evicted from the train. So close. Uh, he ended up uh, in a romantic entanglement with someone, and so I could not go back to my seat. Uh, so I spent almost the entire trip in the observation deck reading Haruki Murakami's 1Q84. I love that book. Uh, which is an odd book, but it was the perfect context for reading this strange, massive, very readable, um, surrealistic novel and it was great. I sort of left California in like late March, early April. It was like beautiful, sunny, sideways, like late, uh, like early spring sunlight in Redding, California. And when the sun came up and we were in Klamath Falls, it was like the dead of winter. Mm. There was like snow falling and it looked like the North Pole. And it really was this like absolutely strange trip. Uh, but you're right. Like a good book will make a otherwise untenable travel situation way more tenable and it's you know like taking a train from tokyo to the coast like over the mountains that could have very well have been snowy you know to visit mm -hmm. i think he had a relative in in care or something like that uh, i also have a very specific memory associated with that book in the summer too although i think i'll hold off on sharing it we might read that book one day i definitely feel like that book if, if, if Upper Middle Brow continues, it's hard for me to imagine us not eventually getting to 1Q84. Yeah, or at least like a, a, a long dip in Murakami. Yeah. I think he's too, he's too like absolutely right on the nose of Upper Middle Brow. He is exactly. He is exactly <laughs> what we're doing. Um, yeah. Do you want to hear our, our uh, next one? Yeah, let's do it. This is from Lulu Miller of uh, uh, Radio hooray. Lab and Terrestrials. Um, and I'll just go ahead and play. This was the last one we got. I had to kind of wheedle a little bit, but I, uh, she sent it to me this morning. So uh, here we go. What's up, boys? Um, all right, I'm here with your, your uh, fresh off the presses summer reading recommendations. Um, okay, so things I like to read in the summer are a little fun, a little popcorn y, bubble gummy slide the slide, ride the ride. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm going to recommend a quick trio, trio of books um, that all center around the theme of interspecies love. Interspecies trysts, flings, emotional relationships. Uh, number one, Bear by Marion Engel, probably my favorite novella. Alive, that, that alive, it feels alive, that is. Um, written in the 70s by a Canadian author 
Uh, and it was simultaneously like banned and it won an equivalent of the Pulitzer in Canada, the General Something Award. Uh, it's great. So it's a lusty little read uh, about a mousy archivist who gets an assignment to archive an island, a, a man who's passed away his estate, and she finds among his possessions a bear. And they are the only pe they are the only beings on that island, and uh, things transpire. Number two, Mrs. Caliban. I think this one might also be 70s, maybe it's 60s. I should have looked it up. You know, people have said the shape of water is sort of ripped off of it, not based on it, but like ripped off. I don't know. I think there can be multiple stories of women falling in love with frog-like, fish-like science experiments that, that get out. Um, but check that one out. Uh, and then finally, a book called Pisces uh, by, 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 these would be good things to look up. by Melissa Broder, which is a very little naughty, naughty story about a woman and a merman uh, who she kind of drags ashore in like a wheelbarrow. And anyway, they're just fun. They're basically romance novels, but like with a literary wink, they're, they're really well done. Um, they're naughty, they're strange, they're eerie. Um, I think what appeals to me about interspecies stuff is like partially the fun of it. Like I, I, uh, but I, I think I think they're often metaphorical um, for a kind of queerness, for just jumping out of the rules of things. I'm not here to advocate bestiality, but I am here to get to like read about animals and think about other minds and how that might work in love, and to see characters who are so kind of like dismayed by humanity, how humanity can take a toll on them, that they, they, they reach for a love that, and like a kind of mind um, that's really beyond a norm. And, and I don't know, for me, I think that's always like a reminder that you can reach outside rules. And so there's like a thrill, there's a chuckle, uh, and they are, they are all strange and they are all quick reads. So there you go. Bear by Marion Engel, Pisces by Melissa Broder, and Mrs. Caliban by um, Rachel Ingalls. Have fun. Farewell. Have a great summer. That was Lulu. My favorite part of that is the, is the farewell. Have a great summer. As if like like Lulu is just is like departing on like a like a voyage. Yeah. <laughs> like never to be seen for the rest of the summer uh, while she's off reading uh, stories of inter interspecies love. I, you know, one of the things I have noticed that there is definitely a substantial percentage or portion of readers who want something steamy during the summer. Like this, this, you know, based on our last episode, this is clearly a thing. This is part of summer reading for some people involves mm -hmm. romance and maybe sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. You know what, what Lulu's, what, what her, uh, what her section there just makes me think of is like, you know, we've been talking a lot about speculative fiction and what she's saying, you know, like I'm not into bestiality, but like, I think it's interesting to ask these questions yeah. about like, it's another what if question. It's like speculative fiction comes to the romance novel. Like what if like we didn't like stick to our, like our own speciation in terms of uh, romance. And I think that's something that's a really clever um, thing to notice or to point out. You know, I don't know that these would be summer reads for me, you know, that they, they might be more like winter reads. Um, mm. I trust Lulu, and uh, I think I have a certain amount of squeamishness around this topic. And, you know, we remember the summer camp where we used to work. You remember the barn climb uh, sort of map of comfort, creative of creative challenge and comfort? Oh, yes. 
Right. Yes, yes. I, I refer to the yo-yo panico zone with like alarming regularity in my professional life. Right. And so the idea here is that we all have a comfort zone where we're safe in. It could be with reading. It could be with something athletic. It could be with something professional. It could be with a relationship. That, But we don't tend to grow if we stay in that zone. And then mm -hmm. there's a sort of creative challenge zone outside of that that's hard and it's uncomfortable, but that we sort of need to enter into that to grow. And then we'll probably want to rest and recover by coming back into the comfort zone. And then there's also the yo-yo panico zone, which is just not fun. And we probably don't want to get into it, but we are going to get into it sometimes. And it's best to be prepared for that and, you know, sort of try to figure out how we're going to get back into that creative challenge zone again. And, you know, I do feel like these books are sort of, they sound like creative challenge books for me. Like, I feel like I would have a little bit of squeamishness around them, but they would have the kind of effect that you're talking about as a kind of, a kind of romantic, sociological, emotional thought experiment that's actually pretty important. Um, mm -hmm. I will also say, though, this voice memo actually made me come up instantly with another uh, upper middle brow pop quiz for you. Um, okay. So you ready? Um, yes. What author published a novel in the 1970s that features interspecies sex as an important plot point in a way for different species in a kind of sci-fi alien context to cement kind of like diplomatic alliances and i, I have a uh, ah <laughs> you didn't even need the multiple choice <laughs> yes this is very funny because as we were listening to lulu's uh piece i was like doesn't larry niven have an inner species like yeah. short story or something in, in ring world the um the, the you know Ringworld is this enormous planet that is as big as a solar system just about and there are you know thousands if not millions of different species that um, are not generally speaking sexually compatible um, but they are many of them are sort of humanoid and so one of the uh, sort of rituals on this world when you're sort of cementing or uh, making an alliance with another sort of group um, is to do something called Rish Rishathra, which mean, which is somebody from your group and somebody from their group gets it on. And that sort of seals the deal, you know, of your uh, diplomatic encounter. Um, so once again, Larry Niven is with us. I can uh, I can extend this. Uh, I won't make this a quiz or anything like that. Um, but uh, Larry Niven has a very funny short story called Man of Steel, Woman of Kleenex, mm. uh, which imagines the uh, very real interspecies problem of Superman and Lois Lane. Mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And uh, like, I, I won't, I won't, you know, we're, we're mostly, I mean, we're somewhat explicit. We say swears and things like that. We don't yeah. need to get into the core of it but i will just say that if all of superman's uh, biological processes have the same sort of power and superchargedness of the rest of what he does sex with lois lane is going to be a real problem for her yes yes indeed it would be um and, <laughs> well maybe we uh maybe we'll leave it at that um I was. I actually wanted, before we move on to other voicemails, to ask you, this is the question we asked our two guests last time, and Lulu sort of spoke to it. I think Justin sort of spoke to it, which is, is summer reading kind of relevant to you as a concept? Um, do you read differently in the summer than other times of the year? Huh. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm sure this was different when I was a teacher still. Um, and would sort of have a summer off. Um, but like, you know, when you're an English teacher, your whole life kind of re revolves around reading. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I think they, I think my reading does change in the summertime. I think I do trend a little bit more towards lighter things. Um, my reading, my, my book that I put, that I picked is probably sort of like literary light, I might say. Um, and that, that is sort of where I end up a little bit more often when I'm reading in the summertime. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, ideally, there's a little more travel in the summer, there's a little more lazy time. Um, and uh, I always spend a couple weeks in Maine, um, seeing my family. Um, and that's when I read Norwegian Wood last summer, which, you know, is maybe not a lighter book, but is uh yeah, a very readable book 
for, for the summertime. Yeah, I think that I don't really tend to have the summers off. Um, I do tend to read differently while I'm traveling, and I do tend to travel more in the summer. And I think that when I'm traveling, I do want a lighter, more entertaining book. Maybe, you know, sort of for the reasons I was explaining, or, you know, sometimes you're under a little bit of stress or you don't quite feel at home. And so something, having a book that quickly becomes comforting and sort of gives you the sense of like, oh, I'm going to return to these characters that I've gotten to know. I, I like, and I also, I think I like long books in the summer for that same reason too, because I like the sense of settling into the book. And once I've gotten to know the characters of really being able to spend some deep time with them too. Mm -hmm. And I, um, so I remember reading Infinite Jest the first summer that uh, I worked in Maine and, you know, going off on these seven day trips and coming back and then sort of like, my wacky friends, you know, at the tennis academy and, you know, throughout Boston were kind of like there waiting for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I do I do like that. And then I love when I'm traveling to have books that somehow resonate with the way I'm traveling. So like your experience of mm -hmm. being on the train and reading 1Q84 or a few summers ago, I read Where the Crawdad Sings while I was, you know, sort of driving and then in North Carolina on the coast in a similar landscape. Or I drove through Mexico and read uh, La Lacuna by Barbara Kingsolver, you know, and which is describing these things happening in Mexico and also somebody who is going from Mexico to the United States and passing between those spaces and observing sort of what's different about those places. And I do like that a lot in the in. Mm -hmm. in so, yeah, I don't know if I really have summer reads, but I do seem to have travel reads and I do travel yeah. more in the summer. So maybe that is close enough i think infinite jest is really rewards something like that like you need you need to be a captive somewhere <laughs> like you need to be stuck on a plane or in like a like a car or a bus or a van or a boat um you really need to think oh this book is hard but there's literally nothing else for me to do uh and and once and you need that for the first like, like 100, 100 pages. to 200 yeah, pages yeah yeah, yeah. I feel like, like yeah, it, it's like that at first, and then once you once you start revisiting the characters and you figure it out who they are and sort of where the plot points are going, then it sort of pulls you along. But yeah, I agree with that too. And I think I had actually started it elsewhere. I had started it. I remember reading it as a bus driver uh, in mm. Charlottesville, um, and which was the job I did right until that summer. Um, and mm -hmm. I can even remember being in a particular place, and I think the first moment the book started pulling me along was a moment in one of the AA meetings where there is an Irish guy in recovery and he starts talking about like he's had sort of liquid bowel movements for the last year. He's been, but at some point in his recovery, he recovers enough that one day he looks in the toilet and by God, he sees a tard, an actual solid <laughs> tard in the toilet. And then the whole thing is written in sort of, you know, dialectic Irish Boston accent. And I, I remember that moment where I was like, I, th I think I'm enjoying this now, which is sort of unfortunate because it's a little bit of an ethnic joke and definitely some potty humor. But oh, well, you know, yeah. that's that's what brought me in. Anything, anything to get you there. Yeah. Yeah. Ready for some more voicemails? Let's do it. OK, this is from my friend and former colleague at WBEZ. Hello, my name is Shannon Heffernan, and I'm recommending In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I don't really listen to books that often. It's just not how my attention span works. But but this one I listened to um, on audiobook when I was making this long drive by myself. And the book put me into an absolute trance. Um, the writing is... Uh, so clear and intimate, it feels like the author is talking right to you. Um, it's a book about uh, domestic violence in a queer relationship, but it's really about so much more than that. It's about how we tell stories to ourselves and others, what gets remembered, whose memories um, are solidified. And I I think it's... Uh, just a very smart and beautiful book. Uh, each chapter is told using like a different narrative con convention. Uh, like one is a choose your own adventure chapter, for example. And I think it's the kind of thing that if it were not in the hands of such a talented writer could feel like a gimmick, 
but it ends up being such an important part of how you understand what she's trying to say to you. And, um, and I love it and I love it and I think everybody should read it. So, um, enjoy your summer read of In the Dream House. I love the idea of a choose your own adventure chapter. Mm -hmm. There's definitely some of the, you know, um, Jennifer Egan type experimenting going on there. It sounds like. Uh, It it reminds me, I don't know where I was reading this. Uh, No, this is in the podcast I'm presently obsessed with. um, The 60 songs that mm -hmm. uh, explain the nineties. Um, uh, Rob Harvilla, the host, talks about the the use of second person in song. Mm. And this is something that you and I have talked about a bunch, too, about the use yeah. of second person. Uh, he does refer to um, Jay McInerney's uh, second person. Uh, he, he sort of savages it in uh, in a pretty quick throwaway, sort of like, like a 1980s overwritten hipster novel, uh, Jay McInerney's Bright Lights, Big City, um, but talks about the fact that uh, you, without the second person, you can't have choose your own adventure books. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what That's a true. great observation. <laughs> like the stalwart of the form is uh, is the second person. There's also a lot of uh, second person in tabletop uh, role-playing games as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, um, yes. You walk into the dungeon. Right. It sounds like dripping, I don't know, ichor. <laughs> oh, indeed. Is it a, is it a slime jelly? Uh, <laughs> it's um, got to be a dwarf's cube. Yeah. I also love the way in which a certain kind of book can really be company on a long road trip when you're driving alone, <laughs> you know, yeah. and how, how it can start to feel like it's talking to you and you're in this very immersive experience. And I've actually gotten to the point where I listen to more books than I, than I read on page um, nowadays. And partly that's to do with my habits and, and other things. But uh, yeah, d- I definitely relate to that. I'm going to play another one. Hi, Jesse and Chris. It is Leah Jones from Finding Favorites Podcast here with two summer reading recommendations for you. The first is not new, but I will never stop recommending it as the perfect summer series. And that is the Thursday Next series by Jasper Ford. Jasper creates the most amazing worlds. Every time he sets out to create a new world, it is phenomenal. And in the Thursday Next series, we follow a book world detective who goes in and out of book world and our, you know, our our current world, investigating things that have happened in manuscripts, crimes that are happening in book world. And it explores what is life like for characters of fiction books when they are not being read. Um, So I will always recommend the books the Thursday next series, start with the air affair. If you are a lifelong reader, you will be delighted by what Jasper has is bringing to the forefront. The other one is a book that I am looking forward to reading. I have it next. It's the next audiobook I'm going to listen to. And that is Abraham Josie Reisman has written a book called ringmaster about Vin- Vince McMahon and the unmaking of America. Um, I think I talked to Chris about it, how Josie has coined the phrase Neo kayfabe. And I am so excited to dig into this, this book. I'm talking to Josie this weekend for finding favorites. And, um, I'm so excited. I wish I had time to finish reading it before our interview this weekend. Um, I hope you are well and getting ready for a fun summer. You know, the, um, I feel like ringmaster, you know, a number of people have said they don't read as much nonfiction over the summer. You know, you're looking for something light. Maybe you're looking for something Mm -hmm. escapist. I feel like ringmaster would be a great summer read for me. You you know, like it's the kind of nonfiction book that still sort of pulls, sounds like it would pull you along as much as a great novel. And I'm, you know, I'm mildly obsessed with professional wrestling. And I do think, you know, there's, Vince McMahon sort of playing with what is real and what is not, this notion of neo kayfabe and, you know, certain politicians and and reality TV stars. There's a lot going on that's worth sort of unpacking. And the way that people seem to be able to kind of 
play with that space between reality, fiction, in a way that sort of allows people to build celebrity and power and also escape consequences in many respects, because maybe everything is a little bit of a game. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean... I mean, one thing that I think is funny is that, you know, kayfabe as a term isn't really that old. And, but the fact that it's got such a, a depth of like market penetration that we need neo kayfabe to explain something else that's going on in America um, is a real, a real sign that like as weird a term as that is. um, And, and sort of, it's like such an odd portmanteau. Um, that we need a new version of it to explain, you know, um, like America. Um, but I think you're right. Like, I mean, can't you imagine, I mean, you can imagine the plot ideas of like the great Gatsby superimposed over professional wrestling, like the same ideas about nostalgia and loss and image and pretend and fakery um you just got to think about the books in Gatsby's library where he hasn't even cut the pages like he's so not invested in the illusion um the real depth of the illusion in the same way that like nobody really thinks that it's real in professional wrestling right but what's important is the uh, the depth of the depth of the illusion that the illusion seems like it could be real, which is so, which is such a strange inversion of, of illusion. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it's interesting. Both of Leah's picks have to do with playing between the difference between the real and the imagined too, right? Like you have uh, Jasper Ford is writing these books where the characters, you know, have a life beyond the the book which is i'm even mm-hmm. i'm hard I'm, I'm having a hard time even imagining that as a narrative convention like how do you even how's it even written but i certainly think that anyone who's tried to write will appreciate the for the power of the metaphor there right of characters who aren't doing what the writer wants them to, you know you want to tell this like tight little story and you want certain things to happen and you're reaching for certain symbolism and the characters seem to have other ideas. Uh, I think that's a real experience that many writers have. And, you know, I don't know that Jasper Ford's the only person to literalize that. I, it's, you know, it's, it's something that happens from time to time. But those books sound exciting, too. I think maybe my mom was reading one of them. Well, should we do our recommendations? Yeah. So I'm recommending um, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Mm. Um, This is uh, not going to be any kind of groundbreaking uh, recommendation, nor will it showcase Zevin to anyone new. I think she's, uh, you know, this this book was a hit, uh, but um, I'm about halfway through and it reads real easy, um, but it's still a good literary work. I think it's, uh, it's a real... It's a very strong possibility for a future upper middle brow uh, uh, read. But um, yeah, I wanted to read this section. Uh, This is about three medium paragraphs. It'll probably take me about a minute or so to read. But uh, this is from the very first chapter. One of our protagonists, Sam Mather, um, has, uh, he is a, at this point, I believe he is a sophomore or a junior at, uh, Harvard university. Um, and in the red line station in Harvard square, he sees his childhood friend, Sadie Green, uh, who he's been estranged from for a few years. Um, but, uh, yeah, here we go. He was about to call her name, but then he didn't. He felt overwhelmed by how much time had passed since he and Sadie had last been alone together. How could a person still be as young as he objectively knew himself to be and have had so much time pass? And why was it suddenly so easy to forget that he despised her? Time, Sam thought, was a mystery. But with a second's reflection, he thought better of such sentiment. Time was mathematically explicable. It was the heart, the part of the brain represented by the heart, that was the mystery. Sadie finished staring at whatever the crowd was staring at, and now she was walking toward the inbound red line train. Sam called her name. Sadie! 
In addition to the rumble of the incoming train, the station was roaring with the usual humanity. A teenage girl played Penguin Cafe Orchestra on a cello for tips. A man with a clipboard asked passersby if they could have a spare moment for Muslim refugees in Srebrenica. Adjacent to Sadie was a stand selling $6 fruit shake. The blender had begun to whir, diffusing the scent of citrus and strawberries through the musty subterranean air, just as Sam had first called her name. Sadie Green, he called out again. Still, she didn't hear him. He quickened his pace as much as he could. When he walked quickly, he counterintuitively felt like a person in a three-legged race. Sadie, Sadie, he felt foolish. Sadie Miranda Green, you have died of dysentery. And scene. <laughs> yeah, it goes, it goes from there. He does get her attention with that, I will say. That that is the key the, that unlocks the uh, that her attention, uh, which I, you know, for, for people in your my generation, the phrase you have died of dysentery will instantly... <laughs> If we have had the experience of playing Oregon Trail, transport us back to those particular moments. I played them on an Apple TGS, the old green and black um, version. Same here. Um, yeah, I missed the sort of next iteration of of the Oregon Trail, the kind of uh, more more lavishly done color versions um, on like a VGA or a EGA monitor. Um, but, uh, I just think that this, that, that passage, like there's this little section, like he, she manages to muse about time and then emotions, the difference between thought and feeling that is, you know, runs through all of literature. Um, nice little scene setting of like the rest of the world kind of going on around the action of your novel. Um, and then like a moment that like really crystallizes what this book is going to be about. Like, oh, this is a relationship that is founded on, you know, computer games. Um, and I just thought like such an efficient and effective way of doing character development and scene and setting development. How early in the book is that, is that scene? Oh, that we are, we are, we are on page five, Okay. but the book starts on page three. You know, this is, this is very, very early. I was thinking about reading the opening paragraph cause it's also a killer in terms of, uh, of, of, letting us know where we are but that passage i read i thought was better and gives me a chance to talk about oregon trail yeah we played it on apple 2gs but i remember i think we had whatever graphics they had natari that our apple 2gs had that kind of graphic card so it was full color but very blocky and so i'm curious do we know up to that point that the have we met sadie and do we know that sadie might have you know gone to school with this character or is that scene how we learn that or, or gather that you're gathering all of that in these first few pages mm. um and uh and she does a really good job of like getting us there on the hurry up the moment that grabs me i mean obviously the ending line is wonderful but the moment that i went from like oh this could be any book to like oh i think i do want to read this was the thinking about time being funny and then being like, no, it's not time, it's me. Time is always time. It, it is something about yeah. me changing. And what that says about, you know, we learn in that moment that this protagonist is thoughtful, is, in, you know, a sort of introspective, introverted, precise, all of mm -hmm. these things. It's the sort of thought I would have, or at least I relate to as well. And it, it also suggests a kind of, you know, neurotic, mildly neurotic character too like yeah. you know why does it really matter whether it's time or the heart but um i'll i found that moment super compelling where's the city that it's happening in uh boston oh okay, um, yeah, okay. we're in we're in boston uh yeah good good literary stopping grounds yeah yeah a lot of mass hole content on this episode <laughs> we also we have justin we have lulu we have you we had the yeah. 2004 world series uh, so my recommendation, my recommendation, I was going to go with something else, but after seeing the uh, Stephen Skosh interview, it snapped me out of my original pick and I wanted to do go with something about baseball. So I am recommending The Art of Fielding by Chad Harbach. Great. You're giving me the thumbs up. It's a great baseball novel. You know it. I think also the other thing it kind of reminded me of, and you and I have chatted about this, is thinking back on it, it has a lot of that same feel if you've read Infinite Jest, 
the moments with, you know, Hal and Condenza and Mike Pemulus in the Tennis Academy. It has a similar feel, this idea of baseball as a, um, a baseball team as a family. Um, mm-hmm. Quick plot recap from memory. It's been a few years, but um, we meet Henry Scrimshander uh, right. somewhere. Talk about great names. Somewhere in uh, rural Wisconsin, he is a talented but uh, baseball player but not necessarily being scouted because he's a little bit shrimpy and not a great hitter but he's a he is a really good fielder and he has read this book called the art of fielding um, and a catcher from a college that's on the coast of Lake Michigan in Wisconsin a small college um, sees him and sort of recruits him to come to the college on a baseball scholarship and um, Three years go by pretty quickly. Henry, I think it's Henry Scrimshander, bulks up and he put he, he kind of goes from an Aussie Smith to a Cal Ripken. Like he becomes a kind of good hitting shortstop. Um, but then something happens and he gets a mental block. Um, mm-hmm. And it's an interesting mental block. Uh, he can't throw the ball to first anymore. Um and there's some other characters. There's something of a love triangle or a love quadrangle. There's another subplot involving a uh, sort of discovery of gay identity among one of the characters. Um, there is some interage relationships, sort of old to young stuff happening too. And so you have all the joy of in the kind of intellectual joy of baseball team as a family. And then you have all the dysfunction of baseball team as family. And also, by the way, small college as family too, which isn't something I know about Uh, a lot of great Midwestern content. Um, I think it's a great book. I think it's up there with the natural with like shoeless Joe. Um, And it's also pretty long. So it's a good, you know, soak into the summer read too. And that's what uh, seeing Steven Scoach up on the, uh, pitcher's mound, cracking wise. He's he's a little bit. Uh, I'll yeah. just say this again. Steven Scoach is a little more of a meathead than Mike Schwartz, but I think those guys would have gotten along. Uh, so yeah, that is my recommendation. It's a great book. It's been it's been a while since I've read it. I think it's been maybe about a decade. Um, I, I don't I don't remember the plot particulars of it, but I remember the emotional size of it being yeah. very uh, significant. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I really, I, I really remember something about a betrayal, and then uh, yeah, you you bringing up the fact that like it's a uh, he he really becomes unable to do an important part of his job, um, and uh, yeah, it made me really think um, sort of wistfully for poor old Chuck Knobloch, who yeah. uh, you know right. like uh, even you know it's hard 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 as a Red Sox fan, but he wasn't always a Yankee. He had a he had a big chunk of time, I think, with the yeah. twins. Twins, right? I um, think of him as a Minnesota twin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do too. But the 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 wild inability to get the ball anywhere near first first uh, first base was just an absolutely astonishing development for a player of that caliber. And it's not. I mean, there. You know, you can read about mental blocks. It's a thing that happens. Um, and you know, I assume the culture of baseball is not all that great at providing the kind of support and help <laughs> that a ball player would need in that, you know, suck it up, <laughs> you know, like, totally. I don't imagine, I mean, we talk about baseball being the intellectual sport. I mean, it all, it, you know, as I'm thinking about it, one of the sort of great, well, often told, but never well told stories, in my opinion, is that of Mark Fidrich, another mass hole uh, from, uh, where was he? Westboro, um, or not, was he from Westboro? He was from not so very far away from you. Um, maybe from Eastboro. Is that a thing? There's no Eastboro. There's a Northboro, a Southboro, and a Marlboro along with Westboro. Let's figure out where Mark Frid- Frid- Mark. Um, but he was a ball player who had an injury that now would be diagnosed and treated, and he would have had a you know great likely had a great career. He died in Northboro, and he's he was born in Worcester. What's that? Uh, and he went to Algonquin Regional High School in North Bowen. God damn it! <laughs> I hate those assholes. <laughs> yeah. My God. Oh, the Algon- yeah. They were our biggest rivals. Um, yeah, yeah, Algonquin High. Well, I, Mark Fidrich seems like he was a good dude, and his story's pretty tragic, I think. And it, it's, uh, it's always sort of told as this like quirky sort of you know, rookie of the year story, but he died in his fifties. Um, he was farming in Northboro and a tractor rolled on him. And, um, oh, and, uh, yeah, anyway, 
Um, all of that to say, though, if you want to immerse in, you know, summer, Midwestern, small town, small college baseball with big emotions, big feelings, The Art of Fielding by Chad Harbach, who also went to UVA. Another wow. connection. <laughs> yeah, a lot of UVA, a lot of Massachusetts today. Interesting. Y- yeah, I've got, so I got a text. Um, hang on, I'm going to call it up because I didn't write it down. Um Okay, um, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, this is from longtime listener, zero ith time caller, uh, Tom Ryder, who didn't want to use his voice, but did say I could attribute this to him. So he says, I don't read as much as I used to, but the 2015 book by Adrian Tchaikovsky, Children of Time, is simply mind blowing. Lots of cool spider stuff. From the deep past, I'm still in awe of the works of Stanislaw Lem. I absolutely fell in love with his recurring character, Ijan Tishi, I'm guessing. I don't know. Ijan Tishi. I don't Stanislaw Lem is Polish, so I don't know how you pronounce that name. I apologize. Ijan Tishi, it looks like. Writing behind the curtain in the 40s through 70s, Poland, Lem was mostly unknown. Now he's mostly forgotten. His collection of stories translated from the Polish called The Star Diaries predated The Hitchhiker's Guide by two decades, but share the same level of sci-fi snark. Hmm. Which sounds amazing. Like, you know, 1950s Polish sci-fi as snarky as Douglas Adams. Uh, Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, Solaris is fairly well known. Um, and mm-hmm. I, I've read some of, um, I think I read the Siberiad. Have you read any, Lem? I know the name. Like, I, I think probably to people who hang out in books, that name is familiar. If not, like, have an experience with. Like, I definitely have seen that name before, but I'm not familiar with the work. His, um, the, the, the Siberiad sort of feels like... Um, R2-D2 and C-3PO having adventures together like 20 years before Star Wars. It's kind of got that, but maybe with a little more philosophy to it, uh, a little less just like, let's entertain the kids and walk around. But so, yeah, that's uh, two great recommendations uh, from Tom Ryder. Thanks. Thanks for that. And I've got one more voicemail to play us. Awesome. All right. So I got to do the screen share again. Yeah. Hey, uh, this is. This is Owen. Um, I uh, work in entertainment. I live in Southern California. And, uh, yeah, I want to recommend a book for your summer reading series. Um, Yeah, in the summer, it gets kind of hot here. So I like to think about, you know, cold places in the summer and uh, snow-covered mountains. And one of my favorite books like that is The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson. Uh, It was written in the 1970s, and and it's a travel book. He goes up into the Himalayas with a a scientist, and they're studying some sheep and kind of trying to spot the snow leopard, which which, uh, people don't see very often up there. And so it's kind of a fun adventure. But, you know, it's also kind of a heavy book, too, because he's dealing with some grief and loss. And so he's kind of dealing with that and thinking about that and up there in the, the cold snowy mountains. And I, I just, I love the writing and I don't know, it's strange, I guess, but I like to think about cold places in the summer. So yeah, the snow leopard by Peter Matthewson and, uh, yeah, keep it up. I love what you're doing with upper middle brow. Hope your readers or your listeners enjoy that book. Mm, that's uh yeah, I can't. I can't really place that voice. Something I, I've heard it. Something familiar before. about that voice, huh? Something yeah, familiar about it. Yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, I was, yeah, first yeah, name only. Owen from Southern California. Um, but yeah, sounds. I've never read the Snow Leopard. Sounds like a good book. I, nor have I. I only know it as a uh, as like a, a, a North Face sleeping bag uh, product. <laughs> right. Or uh, was it was was there a version of the Apple OS that was Snow Leopard too? You yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I think so I much you go that through and like, yeah, it, it's like there's like a lot of islands. But you're right, Snow Leopard. That was an operating system for for Mac. Um, I feel like this. I, I, yeah, I, I don't remember when, but I feel like the snow. I haven't read the Snow Leopard, but it feels like the kind of book that like writers don't get book deals to write anymore. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go up into the Himalayas with a scientist. We're going to look for a snow leopard. I'm going to kind of write about my uh, dead wife a little bit. There's going to be some like 
references to throw. It'll be great, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, can you imagine, like, the pitch for, like, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance these days? Right. You know, like, like if it's not, if it's not, like, wild, you know, I mean, because I, I guess wild is sort of like a modern day equivalent of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can't really imagine a pitch for the Snow Leopard where like these, these kind of like vague and open-ended projects um, that, that unfortunately can like sometimes really turn into something quite amazing. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you know, actually, now that I think about it, our friend Lulu, who left us a voicemail, her recent book, um, Why Fish Don't Exist, is maybe the kind of closest modern equivalent. And She's got a hook, which is, hey, there's no such thing as a fish. Fish don't exist. You know, like there is a kind of scientific hook, but it is also similarly a mix of memoir, of science writing, of kind of existential uh, questing, uh, mm -hmm. of history, of narrative. Um, so that's one I would also recommend listeners. And I think that would be a great read at the beach. Thank you, Lulu. Um, but it, it, it is, um, yeah, I don't feel like we get quite as many of those books as we used to anymore. Um and maybe maybe I have a little nostalgia for that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think you know it's a it's a it's an unfortunate aspect of our culture that like we are awash these days in so much content that of course editors and people who sort of stand at the gates of of the publishing world, like they like have to like the gates have gotten taller. Um, and at the same time, this sort of weird like everything has gotten more, like there's just more words out there all the time, uh, generate, you know, now there's just, now there's computer learning that is generating words all the time. Um, and so and it's, it's yeah, yeah, totally. It's a bummer. Um, and then at the same time, I'm sure that we will get some gems of this particular era you know, it's sort of like the, um, you know, if there are infinite number of monkeys at infinite typewriters, eventually Hamlet gets produced. I mean, I could kind of think about our particular moment as like infinite monkeys at infinite typewriters. Or um, like hundreds or thousands of talented people who are struggling to make a living, trying to write a novel or a book on their mornings and weekends. You know, if you, enough people doing that, some will squeeze out a, a great book that makes it through the system. Fielding or something like right, that. Yeah. Art of, which, which took nine years to write. Do you know the playwright David Ives? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, do you know the short play in which there are three monkeys that are in fact trying to write Hamlet? I think so. Is that the is that yeah. the, the the one act the book of one act plays? Yeah. Yes. Right, yeah. and they keep yeah. getting the, notes from their from their editor. <laughs> and the, the 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 play ends with one of them almost writing the beginning of Paradise Law. Right. Right. <laughs> Something like of man's birth disobedient and the fruit of that immortal tree which brought death into the blamagam bed socks knock worth tinkerbell yeah <laughs> he's like completely goes off the rails um, uh some um, which... i was actually thinking about the odds of that and how many monkeys you would need the other day and my brain started to hurt um <laughs> compound... <laughs> there i believe also is a moment in the hitchhiker's yeah. guide to the galaxy where they open up a closet and in the other side of the, in the closet are an infinite number of monkeys typing on an infinite number of typewriters. And, and there's actually a, I think a similar joke to the David Ives, uh, yeah. to the, the David Ives play. Totally. Yeah. Um, well, I've got this poem All right. uh, that I think uh, speaks to some baseball stuff. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a good one. It's a short poem. Um, I'd forgotten this poet's name, uh, because it's pretty like milk toasty name. Uh, just, just Robert Francis. Um, it's pretty basic. It's uh, as good of a name as you need. Why would... Um, and I don't, I don't think this is an excellent poem. Um, I think there's some, some issues with it of, of, but you know, like that's the same thing with any poem. I, I think what I love about it is, is it's suiting of its subject matter to the words that it, it, that, that the poet chooses um, which is, of course, you know, where you need to start for any poem. But um, it's just called Pitcher. His art is eccentricity. His aim, how not to hit the mark he seems to aim at. His passion, how to avoid the obvious. His technique, how to vary the avoidance. The others throw to be comprehended. 
He throws to be a moment misunderstood, yet not too much, not errant, errant, wild, but every seeming aberration willed. Not to, yet still, still to communicate, making the batter understand too late. When I was a teenager, um, I spent a lot of my summers in Lexington, Kentucky, and we got WGN television, and they would run the day baseball games of the Cubs because the Cubs didn't have lights at that point, or they got lights around that time. And so I got to see a lot of early career um, Doug Maddox pitching, mm. and that poem perfectly describes Doug Maddox pitching you know because Doug Maddox was not a power pitcher he could maybe throw a 93 mile per hour fastball but he had a brilliant change up and a couple other things and everything he was doing was to set up the change up and you know he had pinpoint control and he didn't need to overpower the batters he just needed to make them think he was doing something slightly different than what he was doing so that they would ground out or you know pop up um, and that's my favorite kind of pitching. And, you know, like you can watch baseball and, you know, we have six foot seven sluggers now and six foot seven, 280 pound relief pitchers and guys who can throw 103 or 105 miles per hour. And, and, um, I love the mental game of a pitcher who he, you know, he's not going to overpower the batter, batters with his fastball. You know, he has to outsmart them and he has to mm -hmm. use every while and every bit of control and he has to keep them guessing. And I love watching a game like that. My fi and my favorite kind of baseball is when both pitchers are on and doing it and nobody's yeah. hitting, um, you yeah. know, and the game is, you know, it's like one to one in the eighth inning, you know. I love, I love that about that game. Love a good pitcher's duel. Yeah. I love a and good pitcher's duel. It's a similar, I mean, it's a similar weird separation of, of, um, opponents, um, the, the, the pitcher and the hitter, you know, similar to tennis, like this, yeah. uh, this sort of odd separation of antagonists, um, that we don't see as much of in, in other sports. Um, yeah. And it's such an, such an odd way of doing it. Um, that, that you're, you're really locked in this intimate battle with this other person who is in baseball terms, 90 feet away tennis. I don't know how long a tennis court is. I need to look that up, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's such an odd, intimate relationship that you don't see a lot of in other sports. The, uh, the movie for the love of the game dramatizes that quite well. Mm. Um, I don't know if you've seen that movie with Kevin Costner. I haven't seen that. I should, I should watch um, it. Our friend Matt Lunt recommended it to me, and I had thought it was sort of not great um, at first. And he, he kind of explained what was good about it, and uh, I totally see it. And part of it is that he's, um, he's pitching a, a very good game against some former teammates and friends. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of part of what's going on as well. So he knows these people quite intimately um, as he's trying to dominate them. And he's also late career, you know, this is kind of the last big shot you know, for, for glory and greatness. And that's always a good story. Um, yeah. I mean, I also think what I like about a pitcher's duel is that when the ball is put in play, everything becomes a much higher stakes. Or if somebody yes. walks, everything becomes much higher stakes. And that's when you start seeing, you know, sacrifice bunts and, you know, maybe, you know, pitch outs and mm -hmm. stolen bases and all these other things where if, if you're just going to like get a lot of hits and someone's going to hit a three run homer every three innings, you don't see as much of that stuff because statistically it's stupid. You, you know, you know, right. you, you don't want to take those risks. You want as many people on bases as possible. But, be, but when runs become really precious, the strategy gets really interesting. And I think baseball has slowly reclaimed some of that. It definitely lost it in the 90s in the steroid oh, era. Yeah. Um, but it seems to have come back a little bit. And uh, um, I wish it would come back more. If I was commissioner, I would deaden up the ball. And if you hit it mm -hmm. out of the park, it's a double. No home runs. <laughs> there you go. I shouldn't say, no, you can hit a home run, but you have to, it has to be an inside the park home run. So you, ah, you nice. it's a base running home run. <laughs> no, it would make uh, David Ortiz uh, slightly less tenable as a, uh, as a prospect. Yeah, and you know, I'm not a big fan of just big chunky DHs who can hit home. I mean, I just don't think that's very interesting. He's a good dude. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I like him. Um, I, you know, and, you know, maybe it would have made him run a few more laps and learn to play first first base <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, 100. percent I mean, like, 
you know, I mean, the, the National League game is better. We know yeah. everybody knows that. Um, and I mean, I think you're you're talking about like the hard scrabble nature of baseball, which is like, which is really the way that it's it, it should be played. But didn't and, like, those a holes just extend the DH rule to the National League this year too? Oh, good lord, really? I think so. I don't think. Oh no. I don't think pitchers hit anymore. I could be wrong about it. That was another great thing about Greg Maddox is that his lifetime oh, batting God. average is like two twenty or something like that. You That's know, like amazing. <laughs> That's I, there is at least one Greg Maddox game where he threw a shutout, and then the only run the Cubs score was on his RBI. Oh, <laughs> what a, what there's at a least game. one game like that. <laughs> He's like literally like, do I have to do everything? And the answer is yes. Tonight, Greg, you do. Yes, you do. I guess somebody got on base so he could drive them in. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the, you know, like, like America is addicted to bigness. You yeah. know, like uh, I did see a very funny stand up recently about how like, like Americans don't like soccer and it's a low scoring and like, and they're like, look at football. It's like 21 to 14. And they're like, He's like, no, no, it's that's three, three to two. two. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, and uh, yeah, I mean, like, like I, I challenge anybody to like not go to a soccer match, like an important soccer match yeah. that is one to nothing. And like in the waning minutes, the last 10 minutes of a one to nothing soccer match are, are some of like, you are going to see things and like see players do things and see managers do things that are like, you just clear signs of desperation and uh, and trickery, and it's just wonderful. And and sometimes brilliance and beauty yeah. and astounding. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, today on Inside Baseball with Chris and Jesse, <laughs> we're gonna wrap up our long conversation about baseball. A uh, couple jock nerds we got here. Um, yeah. That was a great episode. You want to read? You want to read some credits? Anything else you want to say? No. Um, so Upper Middle Brow is a small point production. Chris Bagg and Jesse Dukes are the creators and hosts. Thanks to Justin Reich, Leah Jones, Lulu Miller, Shannon Heffernan, Tom Ryder, Owen from L.A., whoever that guy is, for sharing your picks. We'll compile all the recommendations we got in a blog post. And by the time you hear this, listener, it will be summer. Music for Upper Middle Brow is by Ben Pajak and Jesse Dukes. Design and website by me, Chris Bagg. And you can learn more about us at uppermiddlebrow.com. You can find us on Instagram at upper underscore middle underscore brow uh, and on Twitter at upper middle pod. If you would like to get in touch with us, send us an email to hello at uppermiddlebrow.com. Awesome. Sun is still out. Seven o'clock in Southern California. It's probably going to be out till more like ten, where Chris Bag is in Portland, or where my friends are in Maine. But in the Southern climates, the days never get all that long. But still, I think sun sets around eight thirty, second longest day of the year. Uh, I do love the long days. Um, thank you so much for listening to that episode. And I just want to say, if you have not listened to the other two summer reading episodes in our series, go back and check them out. The first one from a few weeks ago, we talked to a couple of veteran English teachers, high school English teachers, about sci-fi and fantasy books that would appeal to teenagers as summer reads. It's a great conversation. We had a lot of fun. We nerded out. <laughs> we went down a lot of rabbit holes. It was really, really great. Um, and then... Uh, more recently, we did summer reading for adults with two guests, Ariane Nettles from Northwestern University and Susie Ahn. Uh, both of them are actually former colleagues, but Susie still works at WBEZ. Uh, and they each recommended a book for summer reading. And we had some long, interesting discussion about what constitutes a good summer read, too. Uh, so that was a lot of fun as well. So please go back and check that out. And while you're checking things out, man, we could really use a couple more ratings and reviews, especially reviews. Reviews are great. 
Um, and it turned. It seems like iTunes slash Apple Podcasts is the best place to leave reviews. Even if you listen to us on another app, consider logging on to Apple Podcasts or iTunes or downloading a legacy copy of iTunes Seven that you can plug an old iPod into. Uh, and logging on and leaving us a review. It really, it really actually does help other people find the show. It helps with sort of placement in the iTunes charts and the podcast charts. Um, so if you're enjoying what we're doing, we could really, really use a rating and review. Thanks very much. We're so lucky to have you as a listener. And I leave you with some sounds of the early evening. The wind in the trees, the distant motors, and some wind chimes maybe. Tell if that's a dog or some kind of corvid grackle or something. Oh, there's a honeybee right there. You can't smell it, but it's there's a bunch of jasmine in bloom, like a whole fence of jasmine, and it smells like sweet vanilla. Until next time.